Hi, thank you for joining us for today's NPP Meet the Authors interview. Uh, I'm Sophia Hupolo, the NPP editorial intern, and joining me today is Chloe Jordan, our special projects manager. So today we're chatting with doctors Sophie Waldron and Chris Allen about their recent early career commentary titled, Not All Pre-Registrations Are Equal. So this commentary discusses how a lack of distinction between exploratory versus confirmatory or hypothesis-driven research can be problematic for scientific rigor and how pre-registration can make exploratory and confirmatory research uh, phases more concrete and also increase reproducibility and rec replicability in science. And so just a little bit about this manuscript format, the goal of the early career commentary is to give early career scientists a platform to share their independent ideas and perspectives and um, NPP continues to accept a submission inquiries for this type of uh, commentary. So um, today our Dr. Chris Allen is a postdoctoral scientist at Durham University in the UK, where his research focuses on consciousness and the coupling between phenomenology and physiology. The goal of his work is to relate uh, the dynamics and the content of experiences to brain activity using brain imaging and stimulation. Dr. Sophie Waldron is a postdoctoral research associate also at Durham University. Um, using Drosophila as a model organism, Sophie studies gene expression changes um, brought about by dietary macronutrient imbalances in specific neuronal populations. And her research interests include navigate, investigating how these types of cellular changes contribute to cognition as well as um, in both young and aged flies. Um, so let's start the interview by um, asking each of you to briefly describe the pre-registration process, um, its impact on research, and as you highlight in your article, why flexibility and pre-registration could be potentially problematic. So yeah, so I think pre-registration as a whole is a way of sort of specifying and documenting what you're going to do in your research, specifically your hypotheses and your experimental plans and methods. Um, and you, you're supposed to publish that on a public repository. Um, it, the way it came about was really as a part response to the replication crisis or the so-called replication crisis, which was a sort of growing acknowledgement that a large number of experimental findings failed to replicate, clearly a problem. Um, and one or a couple of the driving forces behind or thought to be the driving factors behind these problems with reproducibility are things like p-hacking and harking and this is where you uh, might change your analysis to demonstrate a specific thing or you might change your hypothesis that's harking after you've actually seen the data and these are all areas of flexibility that are problematic in in the kind of science we do pre-registration was proposed as a solution to that essentially or, or a remedy to that in the because you have a, a public declaration of your methods and hypotheses you know then no that eliminates the flexibility you can't then change that after the fact um and i should also say there's a sort of subcategory of pre-registration called registered reports which goes a step further and that involves um journals that have that as a publishing format and they will review your pre-registration document prior to collecting data and then you'll get in principle acceptance on the basis of your proposal and you'll basically be published irrespective of null findings as long as you follow what you say you do um, and that that also combats another area in the sort of replication crisis arena that is that is this sort of far drawer effect so this is where null or non-significant findings don't get published and that causes a skew in the data um, and a bias towards positive findings which might not actually reflect the true nature of the uh, science. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so in the article you encourage scientists to evaluate pre-registration documents when reviewing manuscripts which is not common practice at least not right now. Um, so could you talk a little bit about why this is important for peer review? Totally. 
contribute. So um, when we did our survey and we looked at um, the pre-registrations, um, we found um, a range of completeness. So some are really well specified, really complete, whereas others give more minimal details and then they'd allow for this introduction of flexibility when actually implementing the research. And that can be problematic in the ways that Chris just outlined. Um, so the problem also there is that um, that flexibility comes under the banner of pre-registration, which should indicate that the sort of things already been minimised. Um, so the only way to check for how complete a pre-registration is, is to check yourself, um, and they are publicly available, so it's something that's good to do, um, except for um, with registered reports, you can have this extra assurance because it's already passed peer review, so yeah, it's a good thing to do. Thank you, makes a lot of sense. Um, so how do you think pre-registration could impact early career scientists compared to what's been known as conventional peer review and publishing practices? Well, yeah, I, I think I think it's a different approach in my experience anyway. So it requires a slightly different way of thinking than in comparison to maybe the traditional or the more common uh, way of proceeding. And that's really a big emphasis on the early part of the investigation. So lots more goes into planning. You have to anticipate pretty much all the contingencies that might occur during your experiment and all the different potential outcomes. Um, and that's, that puts sort of a, a more a heavier burden on the early part of the investigation. Um, and so in my experience anyway, it certainly meant that the studies that you do tend to be more thorough, but they do take longer. So and clearly those, that extra time can, can be tricky for early career researchers in some ways. But, you know, the benefit is really quality over quantity. So it, it, you might not have as many outputs, but hopefully they should be more thorough and more well, well thought out. Um, yeah. Yeah. I also think that for early career researchers, there's a real pressure to publish um, and also like an erroneous pressure to find like significant results to that end. Um, and if um, where registered reports are concerned, that actually just completely removes that pressure because you'll still be published irrespective of the actual outcome as long as you follow your research plan. So that's really great actually for ECRs, I think. These are all fantastic points. Um, so our last question is, as you acknowledged in the commentary, um, pre-registration is not widespread practice, at least not yet. So what do you think are some of the barriers to uptake of pre-registration practices, especially in the field of neuropsychopharmacology um, and especially in research involving animals? So well, I think broadly, like, it's about acceptance and understanding across sort of editors and journals and that sort of and so, you know, editors and journals really valuing pre-registration and saying that it is a, a, a declaration of hypotheses um, and methods that, that in some ways minimizes the risk that the data has been being hacked or hacked or, or whatever it is. Um, so, so, yeah, there's, there's, there would be placing value on it, I guess, is important. But also, I think what could widen, widen its acceptance more is simply more journals taking on pre-registered uh, registered reports specifically. Um, and there's some new sort of pathways to make it even easier for them to do so. So hopefully more journals should sort of uh, yeah. start using that. Definitely, like I also agree um, with respect to animal research. Um, so registered reports are actually really good there because as we said earlier, they reduce this file drawer effect. Um, so that means that um, actually you'll save on animal lives and animal resources by not doing unnecessary replicates because um, things will be published that will be more likely to be null um, if they are too null. So um, in terms of like barriers to pre-registration um, for animal research, I think there are two. Um, so the first one is that people in this field are just less aware of that um, than perhaps in other areas. Um, and then the second is that I think lots of researchers in our field um, think that their study designs aren't actually amenable to pre-registration or open reporting practices when many times actually they are. Um, so so for example, I recently switched, so my PhD was in uh, rodent models, and now I work with Drosophila, um, and Drosophila have a really short generation time, and that makes them perfect for exploratory research. Um, and exploratory research is obviously really valuable to science, um, but also benefits from like these sort of open reporting practices, some of which we outline in our commentary, and I think those are actually really applicable to um, animal work and would be really good to uptake in the field. 
Yeah, so just to add to that, I completely agree, but the, and also that I think exploratory research particularly in particular is still developing in terms of these methods of reporting and open and continual documentation and that sort of thing. And I think one limitation as well is that, that the whole area of pre-registration and these practices is still developing. And that, that some, some areas just aren't clear yet. So particularly there's a lot of conversations about blinding, double blinding, triple blinding at the moment. Um, and there were some really interesting papers, I thought, like there's a, one by Tompkins in PNAS and a preprint by Hubbard. And these papers show that um, whether or not you get published can depend on who you're working with, on the institution that you're in and that sort of thing. And this is, this is problematic because that's not science. Um, and so th there is a move towards um, double blind peer review or triple blind peer review when even the editor's blind to it. But if you're publishing your pre-registration um, beforehand, that could make it difficult. Let's not say there aren't ways around it. Of course, there are ways around it. It's just that all I'm saying is that the, the area of pre-registration is still developing and hasn't really got mechanisms to get around these problems or at least clearly not yet. So it's still ongoing is all I'm saying. Yeah. But hopefully in a good direction. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for your time and um, for taking the, the opportunity to speak with us today. Um, one of the things that I really loved about your commentary and about everything you've said today is it's so, it seems so forward thinking ahead of the curve. Like, as you said, this area of pre-registration is still developing, but I really hope that the commentary and this interview will inspire, especially early career researchers to think about these issues. And um, I think it will lead to a more transparent and open science in the future. So it's very exciting. Um, for those of you listening to this video, if you haven't already, please check out the commentary by um, Chris and Sophie, and we'll link to that in the posts below. And feel free to reach out to the authors if you have any questions as well. Um, and if you are interested in authoring an early career commentary, NPP is always seeking new inquiries. So please check out the guidelines on the website, and we will also link to those below. And you can submit your inquiry to journal at acnp.org. Um, thank you so much again for your time today. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.